All right. Sunday edition, just about 20 minutes to stand East African time. We're just about to get into the political pages, heated debate and the conversation of what has happened this week. I'd like to introduce my panel, starting from my team right, this is Mukua. Karibu sana to the program. Asante sana. Jared Okello. Regulars in this show. Good to be back. All right. It's been in the US. It's yeah, been in the US. Uh, yeah. Professor, great. Mukaribu sana. Sandy sana. And, and indeed, PC Omolo. Well, Thank you. That's, that's where we, we should start. Let's get on with uh, the first page uh, as, as we get into this uh, conversation. Is Kalonzo, a senator and MP, grabbed land in Machakos at Alfred Mutua Tell's house. That happened. From, I think last week Thursday, when mm -hmm. Alfred Mutua was giving his, uh, he was called to mm -hmm. explain his uh, goings on in his county for three years. He's managed to stay away from the county for, for, for the Senate, mm -hmm. you know, for, for about three years. So finally, the Senate had to go to the Inspector General and force a summon from him. Mm -hmm. But there we have Kalonzo, a senator, grabbed land in Machakos. That grabbed the headlights. Dismiss. Well, uh, Dr. Mutua has managed to do many things with a lot of success. Number one, is uh, avoided going to parliament for the longest time possible. Senator. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, Senate, oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And then uh, number two, is also avoided uh, going to the high courts, or rather through the judiciary. Because you remember he's been accused of a number of allegations, including uh, procurement. And uh, he's one of the people who's managed to use the judiciary very well to come up with all those injunctions to stop appearing. So the fact that he made an appearance at the Senate is uh, welcome. But what that tells us, that in Kenya, our crop of leaders, almost all of them, are not holding uh, public offices with a lot of uh, respect. It seems that, like uh, all of them have been accused of issues of uh, corruption. So Dr. Mto is invited to go and discuss happenings at the Machakos County. <coughs> and instead of focusing on the issues, he says, I'm going to digress. And then he claims that uh, Kalonzo has stolen land. He claims Msama has been... Uh, accused of so many uh, inappropriations, instead of focusing on the core issue as to why he was invited to the Senate, which is very good, because now we begin to realize that outside Amtua, who's been accused of a number of uh, uh, inappropriate action, is not alone. He's got very good company in the name of the former but he could not, president. He, he, he could not substantiate that, Jerry. That's, 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 right. that's the yeah. thing. I mean, he, he, at the end, the Senate committee refused to admit these documents right. that he brought about. Right. Well, you know, Dr. Mutua has been the government spin master for a long period of time, so he understands the game to a, uh, to a particular degree. But when matters appear before Parliament, either the National Assembly or the Senate, you understand that each and everything that is being discussed revolves around constitutionalism. And when you present an allegation, you have to back it up with evidence. So you cannot appear, <coughs> having missed for a long period of time, uh, ignoring very pertinent and important summons from the Senate, only to come and digress from the major issues I think he was invited to shed light on certain corrupt dealings affecting his Machakos County. And then he appears there and tends to drag the name of the Wiper Party leader, who, uh, as a matter of fact, has been a thorn in his flesh. Uh, outside the fact that he has identified somebody who's going to run against him in Machakos, uh, Motoa, when he took the helm of uh, the county, he tried to undermine uh, uh, Honorable um, Kalonzo. Stephen Kalonzo Musioka for a long period of time so that he thought that he could, you know, steal thunder from him and hence become the de facto leader of uh, Ukambani. But uh, from the local things, that is not working. So mm -hmm. he got uh, a political fodder to hit back uh, Kalonzo Musioka through the Senate. Uh, he understands that you cannot make an allegation about perhaps Jared Okello owning a parcel of land without presenting yourself to Ardi House and asking for, you know, a such uh, of ownership. So, so, but, so but, but, but the question then, Prof, is did he want, he didn't, he didn't care about, you know, the veracity of the allegations, whether they're true or not. He, he came with a point, which is to drag, you know, Kalonzo Musioka and yeah. everyone else into a land. I mean, he got the headline, Kalonzo and the senator grab land. It's there. It's in public domain. It's stuck mm -hmm. in our minds that these people sold about 8,000 pieces of land. Actually, shameful. Um, he came out as the typical spin master. You know, he came to spin something completely irrelevant <laughs> <laughs> from what he was summoned to substantiate. So what comes out clearly is that although he, he intended to deliver 
almost a fatal blow. It didn't quite work. Now, that fatal blow was being delivered in the middle by a guy sit with the feet in the garbage can. You know, another, instead of saying the garbage stinks, he refused to, to look at the garbage and decided to divert attention. Two, there is a fundamental problem that comes out from Mutua's performance. That is the problem of chapter six. You know, chapter six, if chapter six had been functional and been made functional by parliament, Mutua would come there being accountable for his political and administrative uh, be conduct. Instead, it, he represented really impunity uh, being propagated in the public domain in an effort to say, well, you are alleging I'm dirty, we are all dirty, particularly the ones from my home, my home base. So essentially, Mutua is actually a very good product of a study in duplicity. <laughs> uh, let, let's bring in Peter Wall. Here's the thing. Uh, Jubilee's narrative has been that, we're talking about corruption, everyone is corrupt, all right? If, if people in the county are stealing, uh, MPs are stealing, you know, you cannot blame it on us as Jubilee, as government. I think, Smart, um, the problem in this country is this. We are running away from the formal role of our institutions. Like, for example, if you invite or someone a witness to a parliamentary committee, especially the, 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 the PAC, he is coming after receiving a letter specifying to him what he's coming to respond to. And uh, I'll be very critical of the chair of the Senate, uh, PAC, not because of other reasons. Because, for example, if I just go back, when, for example, Kidera appeared before that committee, I do remember Sonko accusing Kedera of murder, that Kedera is a murderer. And that issue of murder being murdered was not part of the audit report. So when, Kalonzo, when, when, when Motua came before the Public Accounts Committee, what was he coming to do? And when he was digressing, where was the chair? So when you look at all this, actually you have a very big threat in this country that we are not running our institutions the way they should be run. Mm -hmm. I worked in Parliament for 22 years, and I can't imagine a member or a chair of a parliamentary committee, especially the Public Accounts Committee, inviting a witness and diverting the attention mm -hmm. or the, uh, or the, 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 the core issue why it was called. Why, so why it was, for why me, coming to discuss. Mutua's yeah. case is, is, a, is a real blunder for Parliament and for the Senate. Absolutely. But, secondly, but, but, secondly but, but, let me just finish. Secondly, <laughs> I, I was lucky I was invited to address the senators in, uh, I think, 2014. And I told the senators, and I still hold that view. In my view, the senators will have to do with the PAC. In fact, in the first place, it was only the setting orders of the Senate. Public accounts committee should be taken to the county assemblies. And the reasons to be, and that's why they, they make all these blunders. Because the senators are, are calling these governors for other reasons. You see, accountability means in the act. When parliament calls you to account, you must have been appointed by some authority to be responsible for that account. So I, I, I have yet to see any letter appointing a governor to be an accounting officer. And these are things which so are in law, it, it, it but we are ignoring them for other political reasons. So Mutua just took advantage of the mess. Uh, can I yeah. shed some light a yes. bit? 10 seconds because we need to move to the next one. OK, <laughs> well, 10 seconds. <laughs> Firstly, uh, th there are certain sections of the Constitution or articles of the Constitution that were given to Parliament to carry out further legislation, one of which could be uh, Article 163, sub Article 8, which mandated Parliament to legislate on the conduct of the Supreme Court, or Article 27, that gives them powers to talk about the two thirds gender rule. But when it comes to Chapter 6 on leadership and integrity, it is to be taken by the dictates of its words. Without any amendment, without any piece of legislation, we have to uh, operate under the dictum of uh, Chapter 6 of the Constitution. Sorry, uh, the Chapter 6 thing for me is, is, is a private joke between, I think, the draft of the Constitution <laughs> and, and the <laughs> Because it does not exist. I mean, the Supreme well, Court... Just because we have ignored it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We have just totally ignored it. If we had a government, and uh, my brother from Awasi has put it clearly here, <laughs> that there are certain institutions that were given the task yes. of making sure that that leadership and integrity is honored by letter and spirit. Yeah. You talk of ESEC, a total failure, the DPP, a revolving chair. 
You talk of the police, for instance, through CID, they are absolutely doing nothing to help us perpetuate Article 6, I mean, Chapter 6 of the Constitution. Okay. So once the institutions have failed, that does not mean that we then uh, trivialize uh, the whole Chapter 6 of the Constitution. So I think, you know... <laughs> you still, you think we, we should, we should still uh, hold it. And before. another important <laughs> thing that he has brought, matters of, uh, you know, uh, governors going to, before the Senate, and hence losing seats, for instance, what we see with the Wambora. These matters have ended up in court. And what the court has said is that the first line of oversight is down there at huh. the county assembly. That is how Wambora has made it back to, uh, to the county. So that you don't have the Senate reeling its ugly head on the affairs that ought to have been handled by uh, the county, county assembly. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, let's shift this. And Cod Skips Investors Forum over Huru to Link. Uh, this happened, I think, in the last two days, <laughs> where Kepsa and other business leaders organized, <laughs> you know, sort of a peace meeting and, and invited all the political class to show up there and sign, you know, some memorandum. The president was there yesterday. Yeah. He said that he signed, he signed, he signed his piece, mm -hmm. you know, and said that, you know, he is willing and, and, and is ready <laughs> to, to, to go forth and, you know, have a peaceful campaign. Mm -hmm. but what do you make of this? <laughs> Number one, uh, Kepsa, as a, as a business organization, as a lobby group, works with the government of the day. So for them, they go to bed with uh, any government. If uh, James Smart forms a government, they'll be uh, very good friends. But it's unfair for them to expect that uh, they'll come up with any resolutions when they don't have 50% of Kenyans with them. Because the Railo Dinga, Wetangula, Kalonzo, Salem, Bravad represent the remaining 50. So if you're going to have any meeting and you're discussing elections in Kenya, it cannot be a success in the absence of the 50% of the nation. Even Barack Obama was very clear when he was in Kenya. He was saying that if you're going to have a winning team, Everybody must come on board. But the main issue they were addressing is uh, Kepsa wants Kenya to have a peaceful election. And there is no way you can have a peaceful election if the elections are not uh, credible. So a peaceful election is actually a byproduct of a credible election. What Kepsa should be doing today is meeting with all other stakeholders to ensure that we have a credible election. If you've got a credible election, then uh, automatically there's going to be peace. If you look at the case of uh, Gambia, the president who for a long time people had said that he's a dictator, but he presided over a credible election and he has accepted defeat, so there's not going to be any blood in that country. Had he insisted on having a peaceful election and he beats everybody into a pulp, right now there would be violence. And the most peaceful elections all over the world, they normally happen when there is an, an authoritarian regime whereby people are given a beating. Like in Rwanda, you have, a, you have elections and you've got a 98% voter turnout. It's always peaceful. It's very peaceful. Yeah, but what Kenyans are looking for they don't, Kenyans don't want to, to be intimidated. You know, like the statements which are coming from Kepsa, that are, when you look at the political environment today, the investor conference is sliding low, and they're giving us this kind of information without the benefit of research. So those guys, essentially what they want to do is to intimidate Kenya into having a peaceful election, meaning that if you see any challenges around the block, around the corner, you do not raise them. Okay. And I think it's important for Kepsa today to go back and meet with the president and tell him, excuse me, sir, Yesterday we said we wanted a peaceful election, but actually what we meant is a credible election so that everybody's happy with the outcome. Do, do you think, Prof, they're interested in a credible election? Because the people they should be meeting, they should be meeting IBC. They should be telling Kenyans, sensitizing Kenyans about the process and procedures on how to conduct elections and how the next eight months, how the calendar looks like. Because that guarantees the investor confidence, it guarantees, you know, good headlines, if you like, in the media, and guarantees, <laughs> you know, the peaceful election they're looking for. Actually, they kept some meeting is a classic example of a jubilee engineered meeting whereby the level of preparedness is low. For example, there was no pre-meeting consultation, mobilization, um, enlightenment, enlightenment of who to participate. Two, the question we must ask is who would be responsible for a credible and a peaceful election? Who are the major players? Now, these are the people that are supposed to be singled out, consulted, their views integrated into the program, so that when you facilitate a discussion, let's say in a plenary session, you have discussions of, of, of a credible background. Now, what you did was an old uh, boys and old girls network, all right, for want of a better word, part of the, the crowd, you know, the 2013 uh, campaign crowd. They have moved on occupied strategic positions in, in, gov in, in, um, in government-sponsored uh, institutions and now 
purporting to look independent. One of the things that was really disturbing from that meeting is the tone of the meeting did not sound different from the tone of Deputy President Ruto. It is the same, you either come here, or it's like the old um, dogma in the church. You either go this way and you go to heaven, or you go this way and you go to hell. So you either come here and you have a credible election, or you don't come here and to hell with you. So the real purpose of the meeting was not achieved. Mm -hmm. let, let me bring you on board. And the question that people are asking, I mean, after this meeting is that 2013, we had a very peaceful elections. Where the credibility of it is, you know, matter to be discussed. The jury's still out there. <laughs> but we had the peaceful elections. So why are we beating Kenyans again with this peace messaging, this peace crusade? I think the peace message or crusade is important because uh, we have had the drum beats. Uh, if you look at our political leaders, especially from both sides of the political divide, there are people who are talking very violent and militant language. So I think when people talk about peaceful election, this is meaningful. But I think what is important for, uh, for other players, as Professor said, if you want to be a peacemaker, you can only make peace well for now the two sides are with you. But when, when one side uh, pass out, it, it, is, it is a question of measure for you. So for me, I, when I was in parliament, I do remember I worked very closely with, with, with Kepsa, and they used to come with this kind of uh, forum or meeting that they, they had in Mombasa. But I do remember that they used to be very inclusive in terms of consulting, even proposing uh, um, <coughs> topics, who, who will open, who will, who, will close, who will do what. And I think this is important. I do remember, for example, the 1992 election was very divisive. But to give Parliament the credit that in the middle of that, that election, we, 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 there was a meeting of, uh, of MPs and uh, the opposition and government were one thing in that meeting. What we, we, what we call the first, um, uh, it was called what? The, the, what? The, 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 the members' induction course. So really, it is not important, it is not impossible to make the two sides of the political divide work together. But those who, who pretend to, to, to bring them back together must bear in mind that they're handling politicians. And therefore, before that meeting, you have to do the necessary consultation. Right. If you don't do it, you lose it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, as, as, a matter, as a matter of fact, we haven't seen or witnessed any event that can pass for a precursor of what is to happen in terms of violence or something that may then injure the reputation of this country. And for uh, Kepsa, therefore, to, to do so is like putting the cart ahead of the horse, uh, which is unacceptable. We have had serious issues in this country, particularly on the conduct of IBC and their lack of impartiality. And that is what gave birth to the Joint Select Committee that came up with certain deliberations that you know, some are yet to be uh, implemented or executed. But we hope that they will be executed in good time. But we remember that even to get to that level, Kenyans had to feast on tear gas every Monday. Where was Kepsa all this time? That is the egg. They said about, they're losing about five million shillings every Mondays or Wednesdays. Mm -hmm. Yes, that, that, that is study. what they said. Yes. But then they did not come to the pertinent issues, the issues that surrounded uh, the, 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 the protests at, at that particular time in the day. So for them, you really wonder, why would they firstly go in bed with the government? Are they then saying that all the businesses they are carrying out are government businesses? The individual Kenyans who are actually the voters are the ones who run the economy of this country. The government does not. And therefore, they ought to side with every Kenyan regardless of your political affiliation. But again, it is not the work of KEPSA to tell us how most important the issues of security or issues of peaceful elections are. Because they ought to you know, help perpetuate the business environment so that investors can come but that does not only imbue or infuse matters of uh, elections only. So I, I think, firstly, they are in the wrong camp, they are doing the wrong thing, and you don't really expect code coalition, though I'm not their spokesperson, to get a letter on Thursday to attend to such an important function beginning Friday. Yes, because the, the, the thing is this, that it appears that we have different issues that we're putting on, on the table for the elections. And for KEPSA, they say peace is the big, is the big issue. For the Kenyan voter would want to discuss robustly, okay, employment, tribalism, you know, all these things. Mm -hmm. Why will that be translated as an act of war? Because that's what is being translated as an act of war. You know, you discussing these things robustly is a problem. You know, will be, will be violence in this country. I, I think when you look at the relationship between the private sector and the public sector today, 
Majority of the people who drive the private sector in Kenya, which probably does not even uh, exist, are senior government officials, cabinet secretaries, principal secretaries, are the ones who have created a special purpose vehicle that do business with the government of the day. So, and I suspect that at the CAPSA meeting, was probably not an initiative by CAPSA itself. It's by somebody somewhere who was uh, pulling the strings in an attempt to bastardize the opposition. There is no way CAPSA can sit on, uh, on their you know, air-conditioned rooms, see people going to the streets protesting over IBC, they remain mute. People today are crying about corruption that we are talking about. People are discussing uh, tribalism. And those are the germane issues that uh, CAPSA would be talking about. But you know, for them, they're businessmen. For them, their principal intention is to buy and sell. They don't care about the environment, whether it's uh, a dictatorship, whether it's a monarchy, whether it's a democracy. For them, they don't care. Whether are losing jobs. They don't care. Oh, oh, no, if they're losing jobs, they would care because, you know, then uh, the disposable incomes are a bit low. But you see, for them, their principal uh, partner is the government of the day. And provided the government says we are going to do SGR, we are going to do lapset, we are going to do lakes, whatever it is, for them they are happy. And you know it's a, it's a business of interest because the same people who sit on the government side are the ones who determine what CAPSA gets uh, business. And you know when they say that CAPSA will represent the private business interest, that's only a very small stakeholder in the entire electoral process. The biggest stakeholder here is Wanjiku. And Wanjiku was not uh, consulted in this process. Okay. So for them to tell us Smart that, oh, wait a minute. to an important thing here. You talked about the mere fact that there is tribalism perpetuated within the public service. Public Service Commission, by its own uh, volition, came up with a finding that 65% of Kenyan jobs are held by two communities. That is a harsh indictment on the conduct of this current regime. Where was CAPSA? They just kept quiet, taking tea in various hotels. Besides, uh, <laughs> yeah, smart. When CAPSA was being formed, I was one of the initial members. So we should be blaming you. Oh, good. good to let us know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the wrong attitude. Yes, no, no. When it was being formed, yes. but before it was completely constituted, mm -hmm. I was asked a question, which business interest do you represent? Mm -hmm. I said, I represent uh, an independent opinion emanating from the academic community. Now, I will not mention names, but one fairly prominent member of CAPSA said, uh, you give us people to work for us, so we are taking care of your people. You cannot then come from the classroom to come and tell us what to do with your people. So uh, consequently, my participation, and sometimes <laughs> was considered irrelevant. Yes. You are an irritant. N yes. So, but the point I want to, to, to point out is this. Then uh, the formation of CAPSA took the direction where there was selective appointment of who to come and represent what. So eventually, CAPSA is actually a government-constituted agent to operationalize when it's convenient to propagate its mandate. That's the way I understand it. Mm -hmm. And if you examine critically the people sitting in that in uh, running CAPSA right now, you will find very strongly, and I assert strongly, 30% belong to one side of Jubilee, 30% belong to the other side of Jubilee, and the remaining 40% have been selectively appointed to come purportedly to represent the interests that are voiceless. Of, of everyone else. Yes. Right, let, let, let's shift gears. And it's drama as Uhuru and Ruto meet Karua and Waiguru. Again, last week, the president, the deputy, were on a two-day visit of central Kenya. Uh, this was in Kirinyaga, where it was very dramatic. Uh, the deputy president, there's no picture of the deputy president actually meeting <laughs> Madam Waiguru, you know, so she was not scutting around. Uh, and, there was no catwalk. There was no catwalk and that sort of thing. And, and yeah, Martha Karua, the Iron Lady, found herself in, in hot soup. She absolutely could not address her own crowd in Kirinaga. Your first go at this. <laughs> what did you make of this, this event? Well, I think um, that was local politics, and uh, local politics for the moment, it played itself out. But I would rather look at it in a, in a wider context, especially um, the present visit to, to, to southern Kenya. In my view, one thing that we are now seeing in this country is the issue of the presidency. Uh, I do remember reading the Hazard report when we were moving from uh, from um, a parliamentary system in the 60s 
to meet. And Mboya did say, that, Mboya made a very important comment about why the president should be a member of a constituency. He said that for the president to be a member of the constituency, or to be a member of a constituency, that alone will make him be sensitive to problems that Kenyans do face. In fact, the problem now facing the, our president uh, will, will face any other president. Because you become president, you don't have a constituency, the linkage between you and the masses is very, very minimal. And I think this is going to hurt our democracy to some extent. Because, um, for example, uh, I've seen uh, even the Kikuyu elders made an appeal to see the president. Uh, and, and I think uh, we should find a way of making the president to be a person who can access uh, the public. Uh, where the public means, for example, the Nyakinyo during Yana's time, that was a very important uh, forum for the president to have the attribute of the, of, 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 of the, of the, of the Kenyan. Right now, I think this constitution is going to make the president to be sort of somebody who is secluded from the masses. So is the constitution, uh, I, I think the way I understand it, is moving this power from the person to the office. Well, right. yeah. So, so, I, we, so we need people who I, can I, I actually... I quite agree, but it will, it will take time. You know, you know, I mean, like, um, changing your class is not something that you can do in a minute. Okay. It, it, the same thing you go so for ministers. You know, we were used to ministers who are members of parliament who are going through election, and when they went home over the weekend, people would come to see them, and when they go to the cabinet, they will now raise issues that are there in the public. But you see, right now, our ministers do not have contact with the, with the public. I'm not saying that it's bad, but it, it is a cost that you have to incur to operationalize this case, uh, I mean, this constitution. Okay, the, the, the person and the office. What's important? <laughs> of course, the office. The office is very important because uh, the person you can you can get rid of the the, the office you can't get rid of. You can only modify. <laughs> but really, the point I want to make about this particular uh, highlight: there are three things. Boom for coffee farmers. You know, I am a little bit disturbed by this habit of. Um, Writing off the debts for farmers in the president's uh, stronghold, I want to see this practiced across the country. For example, why were the debts not written off in uh, Mumias. Uh, Mumias, not written off in uh, pan paper, not written off in, uh, across the sugar uh, sector? Could one say it's because the sugar sector? The supporters there are not uh, the same as the ones. They, 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 they work hard so they can they can pay their debts. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that, that could so be. you induce lazy so, men. <laughs> so now that's one. So I would like the presidency to come clean on this because to me this is mismanagement of my tax. Two, the next one is there is an attack on Raila on propaganda. This is clear political bankruptcy. Raila has raised substantive issues. It could be Raila, it could be anybody else. He has raised substantive issues that deserve an answer so that the ordinary citizen, on whose behalf he has also spoken, all right, is seen to be respected. So instead of brushing aside the way Mutua was doing, you can see it's that old practice. Instead of brushing that aside and then getting on to alleging that it's propaganda, in fact, you can see the duplicity. It is the presidency that is currently involved in propaganda. In fact, I'm quite upset with this. They need, they need to uh, polish up. The third one, the president and the deputy president on 20 billion projects, they've gone around the country day in, day out, launching things that they know very well. Like they came some parts of uh, Western Kenya, launched projects. When we went to check if they have money, we, we were told these ones are not likely to be funded until 2018. And yet they had come and told the citizens, these projects we are giving now, and that's what gave trouble in Kisi to this uh, unity group. They scattered because <laughs> pro no money. Projects, were, <laughs> projects were launched. Yeah. When people asked, is there money? Is there money to operationalize? <laughs> we actually sent somebody to Treasury to go and check. And there's and no money. The, we were told these are projects for 2018 and beyond. Okay. Now, this is just propaganda <laughs> yeah. now. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, it's nine months to the elections right. after this month. So, obviously, the person of Uhuru Kenyatta and William Ruto are within their rights to get into politics. I mean, this is, they have to go to their base and talk to their base. And you cannot fault them for that. Well, uh, if you read the Constitution, really, it, it does put a lot of uh, caveats 
on what can be done using public finances days preceding elections. Uh, IBC has not officially announced uh, official campaign period, so they, they are free to do so. But again, it becomes very difficult to know what if a president, for instance, Uru Kenyatta and Deputy William Ruto, are traversing the nation in the name of initiating projects, how do you then draw a very thin line between their political affiliation and the functions of the state, which is catered for in the Constitution? But this is what I would want to say. I come from a sugar belt region, and I'm uh, actually bordering Chemelil sugar, Muhoroni sugar, well, well, Kibos sugar. Off. <laughs> Not yet, and I don't th see them doing that. But you see how the debts, as you say, weigh down on our farmers and yet the government cannot pay any attention to them. Uh, Chamberlain Sugar Company, for instance, is actually reeling on its knees uh, because of uh, the, the, the debt that even the sugar company owes other financial institutions. Because you vote badly, though. Well, that is what I want to say. But you know, once, once, once you have become the president of the nation, you're the president of everybody, and you'd want to perpetuate the good of everybody. That is why Article 10 on leadership, or not on leadership, but on national values, pay much attention to what the president needs to do to the country, not to where he was born. But I want to say something about this uh, Waiguru uh, Karua uh, issue. You know, the issue of NYS reemerged, and it reemerged powerfully. And uh, Waiguru was summoned before the committee, the PSC committee. And while there, she also, you know, spilled some beans up to and including uh, mentioning the names of uh, Farouk Kibet, who is deputy president's uh, hand, right hand man, uh, and together with Murkomen, another uh, Huru's, I mean, Ruto's Ruthless. right hand man. So when all this came into the offing and it did put Waiguru in bad light, Martha Karua, who has also expressed interest in a gubernatorial position in Kirinyaga, found that as a, as a, as a livery, uh, as a leeway into which she could then launch herself powerfully. That is why she hurriedly convened a national delegates conference of her political party, announced that she would be backing Uhuru Kenyatta for the presidency. And you know, that is what people from <laughs> Mount Kenya region would want to hear. So I think she wanted to just capitalize on uh, her and, sister's and misery. Yes, her, <laughs> yes, misfortunes. So the president shows up, and both of them are there. It makes it very difficult for Uhuru Kenyatta to then say that I'm supporting Waiguru at the expense of Martha Karua, because at the end of the day, he needs both of them. Uh, but I think it is Uhuru uh, Deputy President William Ruto who then caught the attention of the people when he said, that these people are not yelling at you, Martha Karua, because of who you are. You're just a perfect lady. But just because you're not affiliated to our political uh, yeah. standing. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I, I think she, he, he mm -hmm. got it right there. So, so, so two problems here. Uh, Martha has her own problem. She's not in Jubilee, and so she's not fully accepted into the fold. That is one. And, and the deputy president who frequents central Kenya has problems with Anwar Guru. Mm -hmm. So how, how, no, how, 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 do you, how do you deal with it? <laughs> Number one, there is own debt for the trip to central province. It was actually not Martha Karua. It was not uh, Anwai Guru. It was uh, Raila Molo Odinga. And Raila Molo Odinga consistently for the last six months has been working on a strategy that uh, these political politicians refer to as uh, voter suppression. He's uh, creating the environment in uh, central province to let the voters know that uh, while the president comes from uh, your village, you are not beneficiaries of the corruption that is taking place in Kenya. And I think the message that Raila Odinga has been taking to uh, to central province, although he's not gone there in person, but he's telling people that uh, corruption in Kenya, it's now about family and friends, that uh, don't bother electing these people that in the name that you're going to be beneficiaries in future. If you're not a member of the family, if you're not their friends, you're not going to get anything. And that one has made uh, President Kenyatta a very worried man. So he, did, he decided to go back to his own base and tell people that the problems facing uh, Kenya have got nothing to do with my administration, but it's everything to do with uh, Mr. Raila Odinga. And maybe at this stage we need to use an example so that uh, a four-year child can understand. In the unlikely event that you're in a public transport, say bus, and you get into an accident, when the traffic policeman comes, the first thing he will ask is, driver Kwapi, or the conductor, is not going to be asking for the passengers. So Kenyans here were in a bus, and the driver is President Kenyatta, the conductor is uh, the Deputy President Ruto. All of us are in that bus passengers. Some of us are noisemakers, maybe like Raila Odinga is making a lot of noise. But if we get but into... This, drives, a, this bus not being driven yeah, properly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So if we yes, get into, if we go that's into, legitimate. Yeah, if we yeah. get into a situation and uh, the local traffic policeman comes, 
The first question he'll ask is that where is the driver? In his absence, where is the conductor? Yeah. In his absence, where is the where is the maker? Yeah. The next thing he now asks is how many passengers were in here? Kuna nini muliona kitu apa hivi? And then I suspect one of the passengers will come and say, "You driver to Lumona to kijio kwa gari, alikuwa mekunywa pombe, alikuwa meka earphone, alikuwa kwa simu, na tumempatia warning." And you know that's where we are. So it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate that the president of the Republic of Kenya, who sits at State House, is blaming the opposition for all the mischief going on in Kenya. You cannot start blaming the opposition for corruption in Kenya. I mean, in as much as we claim that we have the independent organizations called EACC, DPP, that is only the way you indicated earlier on. That's a private joke. If the president is annoyed and disturbed, and he finds corruption a mess, he can summon those so-called independent officers and read the riot act, and they'll come out with their guns blazing. So you cannot start blaming the opposition for what is happening in Kenya. But for but for Waiguru and Martha Karua, I, I would imagine that if I were William Samuel Ruto, I'll invest all my resources in Martha Karua because I don't want somebody who has uh, shown disrespect to me, insulting me in the public uh, space, insulting my close lieutenants, whether or not they are guilty, and then I give uh, my party ticket. Okay, let's stay with it. And, and Rail attacks Uhuru of Waiguru and DP Ruto AIDS uh, still on, this, on, the, on the same yes, pieces. Yes. First of all, I wanted to make an important statement. First, uh, what is beginning to emerge from Raila's continued uh, raising of these issues is basically beginning to convince uh, people that performance is more important than the language you speak. Performance is more important than where you were born, than your mother tongue. Now, that is what is beginning to worry the president. In fact, I have spoken to some people who, who come from Mount Kenya region. The guys, some of them are saying, look, yes, he is our president, but the truth is my business has collapsed. I don't get NLPOs. The truth is, the, the truth is that the, my customers, who are the teachers, who are other people who are having nurses, uh, nurses and doctors and the rest, are not having money to, to buy from me. So basically, in my opinion, Rahil has done a national duty by pointing out that let's hold um, Mukua's driver responsible <laughs> for, the, for the accident. Let's not begin blaming passengers, people, passengers for the accident. Yeah. Two, when you look at this issue, uh, Raila raising uh, Waiguru and uh, Ruto 8, it's very simple. It is an opening for the president to take action. This is now open. It's an opening for him to take action. What is responsible for his inertia? My suspicion is that he is afraid this thing could snowball. You take Waiguru, you take Kibet, then after that you must He's take next. you must take Kihanya, you must take uh, Murkomen, you must take etc. etc. Now, to me, that is the bridge. He alone has a responsibility to cross. Nobody else. He has that responsibility. And if he doesn't take the trouble to cross that bridge, it's called crossing the Rubicon. Yes. If he doesn't cross, <laughs> if he doesn't cross, there's it, a problem. There's a problem. All right, Gideon Moy to be DP in NASA lineup. Uh, that, of course, you know the pet project of one Wycliffe <laughs> Mudamba, Musali Mudavadi, uh, who's been proposing this NASA for quite, quite, quite a bit, maybe two or three months now, and, and his idea is to bring the entire opposition into this NASA super alliance mm -hmm. of some sort. Yeah. <laughs> I've had the opportunity to start uh, what NASA is all about, and uh, probably for the first time there's light at the end of the tunnel. Because when you look at um, Salia's uh, pronouncement, he says that uh, NASA is not just about uh, politics or politicians, that they would probably occupy 10% of the entire mathematics <coughs> and uh, thinking, that he wants to bring in civil society, private sector, how? everybody, everybody who is how, affected. How, how? I mean, because I, I understand from uh, his uh, people that he's been meeting with religious leaders, uh, labor unions, and but everybody. Should, I mean, we should take him to task. Meeting them is fine, but how do you bring them on board? How do they become <laughs> stakeholders? Because that is a question that is not answering. Is meeting them is fine. Mm -hmm. well, how do you bring them on board? How do they become stakeholders in this NASA thing? Actually, now, now the, when you meet with these people, because I've spent time to understand how, how politicians like Jared uh, how they look at the entire mathematics, they are saying for the first time they want the entire matrix of Wanjiko to change Kenya. Because in the past, when you're forming code or any other coalition, you get five politicians, they go to an upmarket restaurant, they order for fine whiskey and pepper steak, and agree 
are we going to divide the leadership in Kenya? But for NASA, it's saying it's not about our politicians dividing positions. It's about the issues affecting Wanjiko. They're asking the question, are you better off today than you were four years ago? Are you a beneficiary of uh, these uh, big and growing economies? So those are the issues being discussed by the religious leaders, by the private sector organization, including KEPSA. Which I did not. Uh, Which I'll take know, a short yeah, break to yeah, go to Mombasa. To, to Mombasa, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and I think um, Salem Dover has got a unique opportunity to actually demonstrate leadership. Because now, when you look at uh, President Kenyatta today and uh, the corruption allegations, and you look at uh, Mr. Raila Odinga and the corruption allegations, probably now Salem Dover is able to put together and concretize uh, NASA and make Wanainchi become uh, shareholders. Like, for instance, all the Wanainchi who are crying, the ones he's talking about the, the local businessman in uh, Gatundu who is unable to sell milk on a regular basis because uh, a multinational has come and uh, is uh, dictating prices. That's the kind of person who is supposed to be incorporated in NASA. So that when you go to NASA, you become a shareholder, and at the end of the day, at the end of the year, you get your dividends. And if Musalem Davadi, we said to have a, a clean record that are... Uh, his hands are very steady. That's what he said last time, that he managed Kenyan finances very well. If he can actually come on board and force out the nation... About 250,000 people believed in that story. And they all came from around Mululu, around, you know, Western Kenya. The problem of NASA is just too theoretical, okay, that the reality of the ground is that it's very hard for Kenyans to relate to what this national super alliance is all about, okay? We cannot invest in it because we don't know what it, what it, what it, what it exists. And, well, and the well, person who's chapping it, we even don't know him. Well, Smart, you have to remember that Kenyan politics revolve around personalities. And personalities drawn from major political, uh, major tribes. And that is what Raila Odinga played with in 2007. And he won the election. He had uh, Musa, uh, Musala Mudavadi from, to represent the Ken Western Kenyan interest. He had uh, Balala. Uh, from the coast. He had Joe Nyaga, even though he did bring very paltry uh, votes, but at least he had the face uh, of the country. He had Charity Ngilu and many others. So you realize that at the end of the day, Kenyans would want to see whether their interest is catered for through their regional kingpin. So politics of 2007 worked at that time. And as an engineer, engineers will tell you that before a machine breaks, just keep it running. So that machine worked for Raila Odinga in 2007. He would want to reinvent it in the year 2017. And when Musala Mudavadi becomes the lone voice talking about NASA, that does not necessarily mean that Raila Odinga does not claim ownership of this. In fact, more, more, more than enough times he has said that we are growing bigger and better. So that tells you that you know, he also represents what uh, Musala Mudavadi is talking about. But you asked him a fundamental question. How do you bring the civil society, how do you bring the religious community into this? Uh, and Musala Mudavadi has said that you know, this is going to be bigger than just politicians. I think to come up with a government that serves the interest of the Kenyans, you must have that national representation and national acclaim so that the constitution itself has given the government powers to employ or appoint cabinet secretaries who are totally outside the political realm. So what he is essentially saying is that we are going to have the interest of the Muslim community in our cabinet, we are going to have the Christian representation in our cabinet, we are going to have the civil society in our cabinet, but most fundamentally, we are going to have a team that can address the plight of Kenyans, shove corruption to the periphery, and then move this nation uh, to the levels where, uh, which is desired by, by all. Mm -hmm. Prof, the problem with this conversation again still is that yeah. it's all nice talk, but for Kenyans to subscribe into it, how do we trust this NASA, whoever it is that gets in it, that they can actually fight corruption? It's still theoretical. So we, we, we can't have, we can't say that, you know, for sure, for sure, it's Mudavadi, it's Raila, it's whoever. It's theory. Absolutely. At this stage, my, my feeling is that we have a tunnel. We don't know where the light is going to come from. The simple reason is this. They are still groping around. Uh, what, I, what I would like to state here is that the, the discussion, the conceptualization has not matured. We need one little uh, punch in order to open up the, the, the thing. And the way I would like to see it uh, punched is by having, for example, the church leaders, respective or denomination, come together and say, look, the way we see, first, they support in principle this NASA thing. Then they say the way we, 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 we see it is this way. 
I'm referring to what happened when AIDS became a national disaster. You know, different sectors came and stated their position. I was luckily working then on the World Bank project on, 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 on uh, HIV and AIDS. The different sectors came and stated their position. Then finally, the government found a way to create a link between the different sectors <clears throat> until the people Mudava is claiming to bring on board have digested and brought out their position on the matter, this thing is still theory. But it, because uh, Raila's people are saying this thing is an alliance all right, but it becomes a super alliance when Raila joins it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I think uh, for me, my take is that um, the problem we have in this country is that most of us look into getting power into government rather than raising issues. Because like, if you look at, for example, Western Europe and even the US, parties took time to develop. Like, for example, there's one time in the, in the UK when the Labour Party actually was like a Scottish party. And uh, I remember even Thatcher said that unless, uh, you know, um, the Labour came into power, the Scottish people would feel alienated. And soon after that, of course, Gordon Brown came to power. I think what we should really be doing in this country is, I don't, I don't object to what Mudeba is doing, but I think it's going to take us time to develop parties which will convince people on the basis of their ideology and their program. But you see, right now, we, 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 we pay more attention to ethnicity. That if this group is not there, then it's not for us. So really, I think uh, slowly by, like, as well, I liked uh, Professor's analysis about what, for example, Sabikus are saying, you know, whatever you're saying, my business is closing. I think. Uh, slowly, Kenyans will come to have parties which are based on issues. So that you, because you advance these issues, then so as so we feel comfortable to come and join you. But as, at the moment, I think the focus is still much more on regions and ethnic groups. And that is what is doing us a lot of damage in this country. Because you'll find people becoming bed, you know, bedfellows with very strange fellows that, that they didn't use to agree with. <laughs> and, uh, it's and because of <laughs> capturing political power. Exactly, yeah, because yeah. you see, I, I do remember especially during the multi-party debate, uh, my little vice chancellor, uh, Joseph Karanja, he made a very, uh, a very strange but uh, correct statement that governments all over the world are formed from disparate coalitions. But in our case, these coalitions are tribal. Yeah, because like, you, even if you look at the right now, the US, you look at uh, Trump, the, those fellows are very disparate. There are people who didn't like Trump, but they had to support him for one or another because of some kind of ideas he was advancing. But in our case, so long as Kenyans are going to rely on the tribe, I can tell you, it doesn't matter even if you bring the angel to lead Kenya, Kenya will never get it right. Okay. Smart, smart, just a, a small one here. Jubilee's win was disputed. The matter ended up at the Supreme Court. Whatever happened, it was validated. Happened. Yes, they, they, they validated <laughs> it. But even if we have to go by the pronouncement of IABC, you remember that the 50 plus 1 percent requirement, the plus 1 only represented 8,000 votes, over and above what Jubilee needed to sit pretty in office. That is a very paltry figure that no established government such as this can rely on. So that is why they have tried to make a lot of inroads to the coast and it has boomeranged on them. They have tried a lot of movements around Western Kenya and that has equally boomeranged on them. And when there is an easiness emanating from central province, you can see he pumped 20 billion shillings in a matter of two days. So that one means he wants to consolidate and galvanize his main support base because he is at a very precarious position now. If he loses part of central province at the moment and he loses part of Rift Valley, courtesy of Moy, Gideon Moy and uh, Isaac Ruto, then this government is heading home on the 8th of uh, August next year. So I think this is the kind of jittery that Jubilee is trying to play out. What Raila Odinga has perfectly done is to shove them to the defensive corner by coming up with uh, serious uh, statements concerning the conduct of Jubilee in regards to corruption. So if Kenyans are going to buy this kind of notion, which I know they will, then I think we should expect Uru Kenyatta in Gatundu next year. Okay. Let, let, well, well let, the let's president keep... always goes to Gatundu. That's his own. <laughs> but I'm hoping that uh, next year, smart, that uh, not as we... president. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I'm hoping that next year when we go to the elections, it's going to be a referendum on corruption. When you look at the headline today in the Sunday Standard, it's shocking that our uh, MPs conspire to come up with uh, fictitious uh, projects and run with resources. So maybe for poor Wanjiko. For poor Njiku runs a kiosk in Gatundu or in Wasingishu selling chicken, and all of a sudden you discover you've got not, you don't have a market for your good. Instead of uh, 
keeping on blaming the president and his deputy and everybody else in Kenya. Let's have a referendum on corruption next year, August, and then we take a decision. <coughs> are we going to legislate corruption in Kenya? We say we are so corrupt as a nation. Let corruption be part and parcel of life, or we kick <laughs> out everybody who has got issues with uh, Chapter 6. Because it's useless for us to wake up early in the morning every five years, elect people into office who have no respect for Chapter 6. We now need to take that conscious decision. And if you're part of family and friends, then you, then you say, let's run with corruption. If you're not part of family and friends, you say, let's look for guys who respect Chapter 6. But I think my, my, my fear with that argument about corruption, and it's really the headlines today in the papers. If you look at that list, and uh, I don't have reason to dispute it, that list is not, is not, uh, is not a jubilee list. The, the 273 MPs. Yeah. And to is, me, this is mm. the biggest problem in Kenya. Because, like, for mm. example, I, I do remember, especially when, uh, when, uh, when we became multi party in 1992, and parliament began, the multi party parliament began in 1993. Believe you me, I was impressed the way, for example, the PAC under Jaramogi, you would not know who is Kanu and who is in the opposition. And I happened to be in with that committee. But today, like, for example, sometimes when I see the PAC uh, taking evidence, they give you the of the, the spot. Normally, the practice was that when an accounting officer comes before you, he will make his presentations, you ask him questions, because it's him to answer issues. But sometimes you find that members of parliament are giving answers. <laughs> it's a member of the committee. Leading questions. And he's, he's, or he's giving leading questions. So really, I think we have got a problem of governing this country. And one of the problems that we have is really parliament. Because I'm, I'm, I'm very much disappointed. Because, like, for example, with that corruption, for example, the, the, the issue of uh, CDF, Senators were just recently fighting. I mean, I've never seen any parliament where you give a member money to do private oversight. Because that's what the senators wanted to do. So the, 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 the trend here right now is that every member of parliament wants some kind of fund. The women want some kind of fund. Members of parliament want some kind of fund. And then these funds are not properly managed. Then who is going to oversight? Uh, the the it's a big problem. It's smart. I, want, I wanted to follow from what he has said. I would like to, this whole discussion about corruption, there is need for a paradigm shift. Yeah. Complete paradigm shift. But I don't want to shift it between the members of the elite. We must begin having an appeal to smart, smart. What are you unhappy about? What are you, what is, what are you adversely affected by through the conduct of these guys? I want, by appealing to your conscience, the, we must change this. These guys are all rotten. Whether it is Raila's team, whether it is Uhuru's team, the whole thing stinks. <laughs> now, what we need to do is appeal to the individual voter to take a conscience decision so that if something affects you adversely, whether you are from Mount Kenya or from Kisumu or from Machakos, what is it that is hurting, all right, your personal development and towards the realization all right, self-fulfillment. If we don't go in that direction, we will keep appealing to the same people, you know, the same people. We, we are expecting different results. It's true, and the problem with, with this is that the Kenyan voter is actually an accomplice to crime because they <laughs> vote for these people, they actually ask for this money, yeah? So, it's an, we, we, we are part of this thing. No, not necessarily, because uh, during, uh, I think, 2010, we voted in a new constitution, and time was dedicated to give us a full chapter Chapter 6 on uh, integrity and uh, Article 10 on uh, national values. So it's incumbent on uh, the head of state, who is the president, to make sure that we respect law and order. In as much as you may want to blame uh, poor Wanjiko, I mean, Wanjiko is a milk farmer in uh, Kinangop. All she needs to do is to wake up early in the morning and go through a list of the people who've been uh, presented before and uh, vote for them. While IBC has been given the mandate to vet candidates before they run for political office. So what is IBC supposed to be doing? They're supposed to make sure that uh, Chapter 6 has been enforced. So it's probably unfair to start blaming uh, poor Wanjiko in the but village. Must, uh, uh, apportioning blame to, you know, saying, well, it's IBC, it's everyone else. These people, we vote these people. Yeah, we put them. The first thing the Constitution says that, you know, they're exercising power on our behalf. 
Mm -hmm. right? So we actually are the ones who own this power. Mm -hmm. So we cannot say that we don't have any responsibility other than voting for them. Mr. Moloya will tell you that uh, the turnover at the National Assembly sometimes is as high as uh, 90%. Yes. Right. For instance, the current members in the Senate today and uh, National Assembly, 90% of them are not coming back. It's not because of corruption, yeah, because but, the other guy is paying more. Yeah, but <laughs> so meaning that we therefore need yeah. to... So we're not voting you out because you're corrupt, it's just that the other guy is paying us more. No, no, therefore it means that we need to have very strong institutions that are not... Uh, that are not manipulated by members of the National Assembly or indeed any other person. There are, uh, uh, let me use an example of Justice Mumbi. Justice Mumbi made a ruling that uh, Honorable Ferdinand Waititu did not have the ability or capacity to chair a certain uh, parastato in the water sector. But that is, that, that's Justice Mumbi, if you recall the case. She, she took a decision. Great. All right. Uh, this conversation is going on too well, but I even forgot to take a break. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to take a very short break. We'll be yeah. coming back with Sunday edition with, with more. I, that's, that's, you know, my view is that the way must be found for us to keep talking.